Welcome to the Babelry. Working, parenting, playing, voting, advocating, and creating as women. This is your host, Suki Wessling. Modern women probably have a somewhat two-dimensional image of what Victorian-era women were like. I know I do. It's really easy to be seduced by the trappings of the Victorian age, the corsets and bustles, the complex social rituals, the fainting couches and furniture with so many curly cues you're pretty much consigned to dusting all day long. True womanhood leads to selflessness and to modest efforts on behalf of the community's welfare, to moral and social causes. But that picture, as beguiling as it is, is of course a screen that hides the true complexity of women's lives at the time. It's true that they were legally bound to the men in their lives, but so many of them lost the men in their lives to war or disease. It's true that they wore ridiculous clothing, but so many of them achieved more in that ridiculous clothing than a modern woman does while sweating in her leggings. And though we picture Victorian women sitting in their drawing rooms, the reality is that most of them had to work hard, either in the home or in another workplace, and that work was seldom valued the way men's work was. To actually reach the lantern, um, you know, at the top of the lighthouse, uh, she had to climb up a pretty narrow, um, there was basically a ladder, and so she had to climb up in her skirts, her you know, many skirts and her petticoats and her bustles. She had to get through that door. When I found out that my hometown of Santa Cruz had a female lighthouse keeper for 31 years, I naively wondered whether there were other female lighthouse keepers in her time. It turns out that Victorian women lighthouse keepers were a thing. Stunningly, at the turn of the 20th century, there were at least four of them along the Pacific coast. Juliet Fish Nichols on Angel Island in the San Francisco Bay, Laura Hecox in Santa Cruz, Emily Fish at Point Pinos in Monterey County, and Julia Williams in Santa Barbara. These four women did a hard, sometimes dangerous, often lonely job that was absolutely essential to the safety of the men whose ships they protected from the rocks. In this program, we'll explore the lives of three of these Keepers of the Light through the work of three women who have researched them. Let's start with the voice of Lighthouse Keeper Emily Fish, as interpreted by historian and teacher Eleanor Morris. Eleanor will explain later how she found Emily as a source of inspiration as she healed from her own loss. The lighthouse is very well situated up on a small rise, so one sees 180 degrees of, of ocean and stars with just a little bit of the safety of land behind one. We have a fourth order Fresnel lens there and very much a treasure, like a jewel, uh, both in the day and in the night with the light shining uh, from its center. This technology allowed us to take light, which is very diffuse and goes everywhere, and bend it to our will. I am Carolyn Arnold, and I am a children's book writer. And um, my newest book is called Keeper of the Light, um, Juliet Fish Nichols Fights the San Francisco Fog. And um, uh, it's published by uh, Cameron Kids Abrams. And uh, it's a picture book. It's a uh, picture book biography um, for uh, elementary school age children. Hello, my name is Lynn Gunther, and I am an author, an artist, and a naturalist. And I have just finished uh, publishing the book, Light of the Bay, Laura Hecox, Keeper of the Santa Cruz Lighthouse. And it was written for pretty much middle school children up to, you know, any age, all adults. And I uh, really wanted to appeal to people who were not necessarily uh, history buffs, but uh, were interested in um, kind of this historical fiction and um, lighthouses and women in science, because Laura Hecox was uh, not only a lighthouse keeper, but she was also uh, a self-educated scientist. 
sometimes the best ideas come when you're the least expecting them. I have been writing books for almost 40 years, and most of them have been science books, natural science. I'm particularly interested in animals and the environment. I took a trip to Angel Island. It is a state park, but formerly it was a military installation. It was an immigration center. And at one time it had actually three lighthouses, but the first one is the subject of my story. And I heard about it on a tour. When we came to the top of a bluff, I heard the story of Juliet Nichols, who one very, very foggy night when the fog was so thick that you could barely see, she went to wind up the belt, the machine that rang the fog bell and it broke. And she ended up hitting that bell by hand for more than 20 hours and uh, with no help from anybody else. I said to myself, that sounds like it would make a good picture book. Writing picture books is um, a challenge because there are so few words on the page. Um, So I had to distill her story down to the essential elements. But there are two things that helped me. And one is that picture books have the word picture in them. That means they're illustrated. And a huge amount of information can be contained in those illustrations. The book is illustrated with beautiful watercolor paintings by Rachel Sumter. I love back matter in any kind of book. (laughs) And so in this book, I did include as much as I could about the larger story of Juliet's life, about a little bit about Angel Island, and that's all at the back of the book. I have been teaching watershed education um, in public schools for the last 20 years, and part of that watershed education is teaching the natural and cultural history of the place we live here in Santa Cruz County. Laura Hecox, our lighthouse keeper, continually came up in this research. Not only was she, her family, uh, pioneers, some of the original people who settled this uh, Santa Cruz, but they also uh, were the first lighthouse keepers. And uh, Laura Hecox, over the years, uh, became a collector of um, many marine uh, specimens um, that she collected in the tide pools around the lighthouse um, up and down the coast here. And it was her collection, um, not only of um, natural specimens, but also of cultural uh, artifacts um, that became the basis of our Natural History Museum, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, And this is a place where I talk quite often. So I thought in order to bring a lot of these stories together about Santa Cruz and its settling and, um, you know, the the history of the people and the land here, I, I... really did a lot of research on Laura Hecox. It's through her that I decided to tell the story of of Santa Cruz and, and her and the history of the lighthouse. When I was very young, uh, I had some little schooling, but started to work in my father's shop when I was 11. And the chance to go to China on a sailing ship and meet my sister there, uh, who had married Dr. Melanchthon Fish, uh, serving as uh, the um, Council's and Imperial Inspector of Customs there, gave me the chance to see that America is only a part, a small part even, of the world. And our greatness may lie in our ability to move uh, uh, between and among others in the world. Both Lynn and Carolyn wrote their books in first-person point of view. So like Eleanor, who has had to learn to speak through Emily, they had to put themselves into a life very different from their own. Research was clearly key here, so both writers talk about how they learned about the lives of their subjects. As you'll hear, Two lives couldn't have been more different than those of Juliet Fish Nichols and Laura Hecox. Here's Carolyn talking about Juliet. One of the things that helped me was that I knew that Juliet had written a log, like every lighthouse keeper, that was part of your your duty as a, as a, a keeper of the light. And um, so I wanted to see that log. Well, it turned out that it is kept at the... Um, in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. 
I made a trip to the National Archives and was able to actually hold her log in my hand. And so day by day, I could see what she was seeing. Now, largely, the log is a weather report. And, but that actually is quite important because we're all affected by the weather. And the weather is really the key to my story because San Francisco Bay, as we all know, is notoriously foggy, especially in the summer. But I also went to uh, Angel Island to visit it to see it for myself because um, I wanted to see the plants, the animals. I wanted to stand at the top of the cliff and see what it felt like with the wind blowing in my face and to look down where the lighthouse had been. It's not there anymore. It was um, actually destroyed when it was closed. And all that you can see there today is the giant bell, which is actually another key because it's enormous. And so it helps me to appreciate what it might have been like to have stood there on the platform and ringing that bell day and night until the fog lifted. That helped me to be inside her mind and to think how, how was she feeling that day? What did she do that day? And um, to try to chronicle what's, what's the life of a lighthouse keeper like? I mean, today, lighthouses are automated. It's all done by computer. But back in those days, she had to clean the glass every day, make and polish it, she had to um, make sure that uh, everything was working. That, that took up much of her time. So I had to try to imagine, well, what did she do when she was not maintaining the lighthouse? Particularly because I was known as the socialite lighthouse keeper with my buggy and pear, uh, with my beautiful poodles, uh, the well-kept lighthouse, I, I think that people wanted to know that there was a connection between them and the people that they heard about in, in the newspapers. It's, uh, she was stuck on an island by herself. Okay, so you may have noticed something already. We'll learn the particulars later, but Juliet, the keeper on Angel Island, was actually the daughter of Emily Fish at Point Pinos. Carolyn says she wonders about the contrast between these two women because Juliet was anything but a socialite. How did she entertain herself? One of the things I discovered is that lighthouses had libraries. Uh, the lighthouse service delivered every six months a small box that had two shelves in it filled with books. And I found a list of some of those books and that inspired um, one passage in my book. And so there were lots of research avenues that helped me to imagine what it might be like for her and to wonder, you know, how, how she managed. I have this feeling that she was a bit of a loner. Um, I think you'd have to be to just to even take the job. She needed the job because in those days, if you were a widow of a serviceman and uh, the person died, there was no compensation for widows. He, and his estate was very small. So she needed the money. In contrast to Juliet and Emily, Laura Hecox was probably seldom alone in her cramped lighthouse quarters in Santa Cruz. Well, unfortunately, I didn't have logs. Um, they were not kept. And uh, <clears throat> so that would have been a really great way to really, you know, hear their voices. However, what I did have was a wonderful book. It's called California Caravan. And Laura Hecox's mother, Margaret Hecox, um, dictated to her daughter, Catherine, uh, basically, their whole story of um, the marriage between her and her husband, and then their travels out west um, in the California caravan and coming to Santa Cruz. So through this book, I really got at least the voice of the family. <laughs> Adna Hecox was a minister. He uh, for the for the. Methodist Church. So I knew quite a few things about Laura, she, that she was came from a religious background um, and that she came from a large family and they loved to tell stories. Storytelling was a big part of their lives. And then I also had some really wonderful articles um, 
two articles that Laura Hecox wrote uh, on her scientific discoveries. And I had her scrapbooks that she had kept over the years. And so I really could see her interests. She collected obituaries. She collected articles on just about everything. She had an incredible curiosity and she was interested in not just scientific discoveries, but she was also interested in architecture and um she loved coins and stamps and just also a huge diversity of, of, of subjects in her scrapbook. So I really got to, to kind of understand where, what interested her, what, what, you know, kind of drove her, her everyday life. Uh, as, as Carolyn said, um, they had a lot of work to do and she did her work meticulously. You know, when they, we come and do their, you know, um, evaluations of each lighthouse. She always got very high marks for the lighthouse. And then her free time, she took time to wander the coast and to do this, this, her own types of research. She would go back to the same locations and she would do um, you know, day after day studies. And she did her, her journaling. Unfortunately, we don't have these journals, but we do have uh, all the lists of the the specimens that she kept. And she did keep a very meticulous um record of, of the, the specimens and artifacts that she had and where they came from, as opposed to uh, these other lighthouse keepers. Point Santa Cruz was not a remote location. She was about only about a, a mile from town. So uh, she was not necessarily a lonely light, lighthouse keeper. And she had a large family. Oftentimes they helped her. Oftentimes they stayed with her and vacationed with her. And uh, so she usually had kind of a house full. So I have a feeling she probably would have preferred a little bit more peace and quiet. And maybe that's why she spent a lot of time wandering and doing her research. And uh, there was a couple articles written about Laura Hecox where they did quote her. And uh, she was very polite, very patient. And people really seemed to like her a lot. She inherited the, the lighthouse keeper post from her father when he died. Her, the rest of her family was, was not that interested. And Laura had served as his assistant uh, since the, the op that for the last 13 years she had served as his assistant. She was 15 years old when he became a lighthouse keeper. And over those 13 years, she really was there um, and um, was his right hand woman, I should say, and, um, you know, really did most of the duties, especially towards the end. Her father was quite sick. And so she did take over the lighthouse keeper duties. And it was her brother in law that recommended her to the lighthouse. Lighthouse boards um, um, to in San Francisco to take over the position, um, and so she did receive that position, and uh, then she kept that for for another thirty three years. After that, she never married, and which is fairly typical of women who were uh, who did have jobs at that time. Um, teachers and nurses oftentimes never did marry because they um, apparently were not expected to marry. Uh, she was um, single throughout her whole life. She had a lot of uh, family coming to visit. And her nephew, Douglas Tilden, um, who was quite well known, he was a famous sculptor, um, he was actually a deaf man, and he attended the School for the Deaf in Berkeley, the California School of the Deaf. His mother, Catherine, Laura's sister, uh, was very active in the school. And so there was a big deaf community that would come and visit the, the lighthouse and, and spend sometimes, you know, weeks in the summertime, um, you know, visiting Santa Cruz there. Douglas Tilton spent many summers at the lighthouse, and his teacher, uh, Theo, well, Theophilius uh, Diestrea, or we call him Theo Diestrea. He was Douglas's teacher, and uh, he became he befriended Laura, and they became very close. I'm not exactly sure how close they were, but I do know that they had a deep friendship. He gave her many gifts, and amongst those gifts were photo albums that he created for her. So he was interested in photography uh, very early on. He had actually um, been inspired by Edward Muybridge. So some of the best photographs we have are from his collection that he, he gave Laura and from these photo albums. You're listening to The Babelry. When we come back... Anything a woman turns her hand to with enough attention, she can achieve. 
and to hand that on to other women as a, a goal, the belief in themselves. Next, Victorian women working, traveling, and conducting scientific expeditions, all in a corset and bustle? Welcome back to the Babelry. We're exploring the lives of three Victorian women lighthouse keepers with three women who have researched them. So there was this, this aspect of the facade that women would put on to interact with the world And then there was the real person behind that that would get the job done. Welcome back to the Babelry. That was historian and actress Eleanor Morris as Monterey Lighthouse keeper Emily Fish. American women at the turn of the 20th century had gone through the upheaval of the Civil War and the great changes that followed. As Emily narrates, many women found a purpose during the war that was denied them before, and they saw a wider variety of options as their communities rebuilt and faced a new century. Coming back to America and the Civil War, where brother uh, was fighting against brother and father against son, it, it became clearer to me that there is a time to espouse friendship, um, forgiving one's enemy uh, and unity, and then there is a time to wait until people are ready to do that. Um, wait until people can open their hearts and understand that we are, we are all the same inside. Moving from that time period when women were really only good enough to um, take a soldier's words down and send a letter to their mother in the Civil War, um, moving through the point where, no, actually you can assist a, a doctor in surgery, you can hold a crazy um, with pain a soldier down and take his pulse with the watches that were invented for women to do so, that were the, the nurse's watch, the, the brooch. But the Victorian era lasted almost 100 years, and in that time, great restrictions were made on women's opportunities and their behavior. As writer Lynn Gunther explains, even while working a physically demanding job in a frontier town, Santa Cruz lighthouse keeper Laura Hecox retained her sense of decorum. Especially women of this era, and especially Laura Hecox, who was extremely modest and really, you know, I think kept many of her most personal feelings to herself and, and didn't share that with many people. So uh, I, I, I believe Laura was quite reserved in many ways, but um, she was very loving and she loved children. Like her, her, her scrapbooks are really filled with, you know, like article, you would think she would, she would have been a mother. She's very sympathetic to a mother. She really cared a lot about children. And uh, I think a lot of her collections were to show her nephews and nieces to share with them. And uh, <laughs> so she, she, she was, she was maybe not a mother, but she was motherly in a sense. Uh, you know, just thinking of the cumbersome, you know, attire that the women wore at that time. Um, Laura Hecox, even with her modest kind of uh, personality that I know of, she did like to dress up. She she um, wore nice hats and she wore bustles as she would go out and explore. We have pictures of her exploring the tide pools and a bustle in her high boots. And so um, and then I, I can imagine that she had to climb the, the to actually reach the lantern, um, you know, at the top of the lighthouse. Uh, she had to climb up a pretty narrow. Um, it was basically a ladder. And so she had to climb up in her skirts, her 
you know, many skirts and her petticoats and her bustle. She had to get through that door. And not only did she come up through, she would bring about six people at a time to come tour the lighthouse. So that's, that's a, a thing that she did, you know, throughout, throughout the day. And so um, it's amazing how women could uh, navigate with those large, cumbersome outfits on. <laughs> These three women are also a great example of how widely varied women's lives were. While Laura Hecox was born, raised, and died in Santa Cruz, California, Angel Island keeper Juliet Fish Nichols had a wider range of experiences. From her birth in China to her education, travels, and relatively late marriage. Juliet was actually born in China um, in uh, 1859, and um, her mother, Emily, who um, became the lighthouse keeper at uh, Point Pinos, um, and her father had gone there, and her father, Melanchthon Fish, was a, he was a medical doctor, but he was there as a medical missionary in China. Now, Juliet's um, birth mother, um, or her, her mother, her actual mother, died in childbirth. And so it was her mother's sister, Emily, who had come out to help take care of the new baby, um, who basically ended up um, marrying her father when she turned 16. Can you imagine marrying somebody at 16? Um, and, um, and, and was essentially Juliet's mother um, for the rest of her life. But they were actually very close and very close in age. Um, um, and so... Um, they, when they came back from China, uh, Juliet was only three and, um, they settled in the, in Oakland and, um, and Juliet was sent off to, uh, Mills College, which was then the Mills Seminary for Young Ladies. <laughs> and, uh, so, and she got a, a classical education there, um, and then, came back to, um, and after, actually after graduating from Mills, she went to New York and she studied art. Um, and uh, she then came back. And as I said earlier, she didn't get married until she was almost 30, which in those days was um, considered to be, basically you were a spinster <laughs> by that age. And um, so, but the person that she married um, he was an officer in the Navy, and um, he became the, um, the district lighthouse um, inspector for the whole coast of uh, the West Coast of the United States. And it was after Juliet's father died that, um, which was um, that, that Juliet's mother became a widow. So, so we, have, we, we have sort of two widows here in this story. We have Julia's mother, Emily, um, becoming a widow. And um, she had just, she had been a housewife and a socialite, um, basically, before that. She had no job. But because of Juliet's connection with her husband, who was the lighthouse keeper, Emily heard about the vacancy at Point Pinos. Um, and she, through him, he got her the job of the lighthouse keeper at Point Pinos. And those days, um, based, the, the Navy actually did not normally permit women to be lighthouse keepers, but um, they did make exceptions. And so in this case, that's how Emily got her job. So there was, so there was precedence so that when Juliet became a widow, she, there was already some, a lighthouse keeper in the family when she heard about the vacancy at Angel Island, it, she applied for the job, and again, they made an exception, and that's how she got it. So it was all kind of interconnected through the family that um, she was given that job. Um, and one of the things that I found interesting was the conflict between her job or her position at the lighthouse, which was at, in those days operated by the Navy, but the rest of the island was under the jurisdiction of the Army. And so there was a bit of um, 
conflict between the two, the, the just the management there, because the only way to get to the island had to be to land at the at the at the wharf, w- which was for the garrison, and she had to get permission to walk through the army land to get to the lighthouse operated by the navy. <laughs> so it was. Um, so there there are a lot of connections here between the her husband's position in the navy and ultimately you know her they're both Juliet and her mother Emily getting their jobs women can turn their hands to anything that they are allowed to and give their efforts to maintaining civilization If we can educate children, if we can um, observe and document what is going on in the world to report that to the next generation, then an important job of keeping commerce and transportation moving on the oceans is just one more little bit of light housekeeping. My daughter, Juliet, was also very capable and did several feats where others might feel she went beyond what was uh, uh, womanly possible, but she did a great job in the fog, in the wind, in, in lonely circumstances on Angel Island. So yes, I think that a lighthouse keeper's job is very appropriate for women. Well, what is lighthouse keeping? It's basically housekeeping. And this is what women have always done. It's cleaning and making things tidy and being organized. That's what women have always done. And that's basically what you had to do as a lighthouse keeper. Um, And then, of course, there were those exceptional times when someone had to be rescued (laughs) or the bell bell machine broke or something that was extraordinary. But most of the time, it was simple housekeeping. Uh, These were the requirements for lighthouse keepers, that you had to be able to swim, that you had to be able to, you you know, sail a sailboat, row a rowboat, uh, to make these rescues, because that was definitely part of the job. And um, so I put these uh, you know, tests <laughs> and and actually illustrated them through the people. And uh, yeah, I, it was it was fun to imagine, you know, looking out on the coast and seeing Laura out there sailing her boat. Her father was quite a good sailor, and uh, he had he had grown up on the in the Great Lakes of Michigan and Canada and New York, and so um, he had quite a bit of boating experience, and so. I imagine that he taught his children how to, especially once he, he, they were living on the coast. And, and that was part of actually being a lighthouse keeper is that, um, that your family was involved. Um, oftentimes, you know, the other family members were expected to step up and to, to help out if, if there was something, you know, if the lighthouse keeper could not do it, the wife would have to step in or, or, or somebody else like that. And, uh, so that was always kind of, the understanding. And I do, do know the brother uh, was taught how to sail too. So I, I imagine that Laura would have had to have some boat smarts out there. And um, yeah, and a, another big part of, of the job actually at, at Point San, Santa Cruz um, was being a tour guide because the lighthouse was kind of a tourist destination. It had to be open to the public three times um, a week. And for several hours. So Laura actually ended up giving many, many tours over the years. And everybody who went through these tours actually really loved it because not only did they get to see the lighthouse and the workings of the lighthouse, which Laura very lovingly showed, um, but she also shared her collection at that time, too. So she was always sort of an educator in the background and not just a student of nature, but also teaching throughout her entire career as a lighthouse keeper when she opened the lighthouse to the public. 
Laura Hecox found plenty of time to do something that was definitely outside of the feminine arts during her tenure as lighthouse keeper. As Lynn documents in her book, Laura's interest in her natural surroundings wasn't just casual. She documented the seashore meticulously, wrote papers about her findings, and actually had a couple of mollusks named after her. Her collection of artifacts was a major stop on the tour that visitors took at the lighthouse. She had us as um, kind of as a banana slug type of mollusk uh, named after her, uh, and that was found in the mountains, and then the fossil spindle um, snail that that was that she not discovered, but that that she uh, had identified. And she really spent a lot of time corresponding with scientists across the country. That was, if she was not out there doing her research, she was actually sharing what she knew and collecting specimens for other scientists too. So uh, she was really vital in marine biology research at that time and had contacts at the Smithsonian and many of the universities around the country. She was considered a conchologist specialist, which nowadays we refer to them as mollusks. Laura was essentially carrying on family business instead of getting married. Emily and Juliet were both widows who had taken on work out of necessity. The fact that these women's work was so visible and important is why we remember them. But it's likely that a lot of women were left in their position. They often married older men, and those men had shorter lifespans to begin with. Freed from the responsibilities of keeping a home for their husbands, women learned skills as they could. Of the three, perhaps Juliet's situation was the most unusual. Juliet's lighthouse is, was not your typical lighthouse. We all kind of imagine a towering kind of um, structure that sits above the water. Um, and which is, is actually, you can see one like that on Alcatraz Island in San, in San Francisco Bay. But Juliet's Lighthouse was actually started as a bell station. And um, what you see from the water is a, um, the bell house, which is a small building that sits atop a kind of a, it's, uh, it has a platform in front, and it, it sits on top of scaffolding which is, um, is about 30 feet above the water. And um, it did not have a light uh, for uh, quite a few years until I believe it was 1900 that the light was added to the bell station. And so the whole purpose of the lighthouse there was the fog bell. Inside the bell house was a... Um, large machine that was the that operated um, the bell and this was this was the job of Juliet or whoever the lighthouse keeper was on a foggy day or night the bell machine had to be wound up um, and it was um, it was kind of this Rube Goldberg contraption that with a that, that um, operated a bit like a grandfather clock it had you had to wind up the chain uh, and there was a weight at the bottom of the chain that actually hung down below the platform. And as the, uh, as the, the weight descended, it operated the machine, which then triggered the mallet, which struck the bell. Um, and so, uh, and the bell was struck every 15 seconds with a double ring. And that was that was the main purpose of this uh, of the light station was really the bell, and the light itself was quite small, and it was brought out. Um, it was a, a, basically a large lantern, and on clear nights, it was uh, it came out on a pulley to the front of the platform, and was lit uh, by the lighthouse keeper. So um, the 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 job there was really focused more on the bell machine than it was on the light itself. So far, we've heard that Victorian women were capable of performing the daily housekeeping tasks at their lighthouses. But what about when disaster strikes? Next, we'll move to the famous and not so famous disasters of the year 1906. Finally, we'll explore the present day. How are modern women connected to the work of these women of the past? How can they inspire and instruct us?
So what I see is the people feeding into the community and then um, the community feeding back. And that echoed in my life. Um, and I see that uh, happening for um, a lot of the lighthouse keepers that were uh, women. Keep listening. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Babelry. We're exploring the lives of three Victorian women lighthouse keepers with three women who have researched them. In 1906, calamity struck the California coast. The 1906 earthquake was devastating to San Francisco, as is widely documented. Although Juliet Fish Nichols's lighthouse was not damaged, the chaos across the bay left her stranded with little support on the island. The damage in Santa Cruz, 70 miles south of San Francisco, was less extensive. Laura's lighthouse came through without damage, and ironically, Santa Cruz's lumber industry thrived in the wake of a disaster that required widespread rebuilding in the area's largest city. But earthquake damage can be confoundingly uneven. On Point Pinos, much further down the coast, the effects were devastating. Emily's logs from that day and the following months include the daily weather report as usual, but then notes about work on the broken light, including a note that work stopped one day as, quote, the carpenter and machinist being injured by the machinist's horse running away on their way home after work. Emily had to balance her own work with concern for her daughter, alone on Angel Island, while the Monterey Peninsula was cut off from modern communication because of downed telegraph lines. Here's Eleanor Morris using the knowledge gained from Emily's logs to recreate the story of the quake and its aftermath. It was early in the morning near the end of the watch of the night. Uh, And at first I was not sure that I understood what was happening, but the animals were restless, uh, unusually restless. Uh, It did, uh, the earthquake itself did crack the tower, um, the prisms uh, that are held loosely in a framework, uh, a a metal framework began to um, rub against each other and jingle and jangle. Um, So it was a serious situation for the upkeep of the light. as soon as I discovered, though, that our light w- could continue to operate, I sent uh, a telegraph to San Francisco, which w- went unreceived because the earthquake was so much more um, devastating there, uh, April 18th. And immediately I worried about uh, Juliet. Um, um, on Angel Island and how uh, people, other friends were faring in San Francisco. Although Juliet made it through the Great Quake without incident, something devastating did happen in her work soon after. It was this incident that inspired Carolyn Arnold's book, Keeper of the Light, and it's another example of how these women broke from the expectations that society put on them to be fragile and dependent on men. It was 151 steps up to the top of the cliff to the path that then went to the army barracks. And that was a good 10 minute walk or so. And this was why even when, if, when she needed help, it was, it would take too long to get there and to find somebody and then to come back. And on the night of the, well, the, the, the fateful night, in the summer of 1906, when the bell machine broke. This was shortly after the San Francisco earthquake, which is a key element actually in the story. That earthquake, which we all know is the the famous 1906 San Francisco earthquake, there was so much devastation in the city 
that the entire army barracks had evacuated and gone to the city and were there helping to restore order. So even if she had gone up the 151 steps and walked to the um, the army barracks, no one was there to help her. So that's another reason she had to do it by herself. A lot of what we know about these women has to be done through detective work. The two surviving sets of logs are impersonal, focused mostly on the weather, the status of passing ships, and occasionally notes about work being done on the structure. As Lynn mentioned, Victorian women, even these strong, independent lighthouse keepers, were modest and self-contained. But we can get clues from what we know of the culture and what we see in photographs from the time. Clothes make the man wasn't a phrase invented for 20th century suit designers. Victorians really did believe in the value of a uniform. Photos show that there seemed to be an official lighthouse keeper uniform for men, though Lynn Gunther says the Hecox family documented that it apparently wasn't offered to Laura's father, Edna. When Edna Hecox became lighthouse keeper, our very first lighthouse keeper here in Santa Cruz, he did not have a uniform and he was disappointed about that. <laughs> so. It is documented that Emily Fish was rather affronted that there was no uniform for women. A formal photo of her during her tenure, however, shows that she apparently had one made, brass buttons and all. According to Carolyn Arnold, she suspects that even when not in formal wear, women lighthouse keepers did seem to have a standardized mode of dress. Some of the men would wear a kind of, you know, with the brass buttons on the front and so on kind of uniform. But I don't know that there was a standard uniform for women, but in my book, the artist illustrates um, Juliet wearing a dark skirt, a white uh, shirt, and a red uh, ba- um, scarf around her neck. And I noticed in there's one photo of Emily Fish in front of her lighthouse at Point Pinos, and she's pretty small. She's standing next to the door, and you can see that she's dressed exactly like that. She has on a dark skirt, a white blouse, and a scarf around her neck. So I'm wondering if that so that it's not quite wearing a bustle, but it's still long skirts that you have to manage as you're doing your daily work around the lighthouse. On May 16, 1906, only two weeks after the devastating earthquake, Emily Fish records in her log, Chinatown burned in evening, only five or six homes left. Those words are simple and informative, but the fact that they had nothing to do with the operation of the lighthouse implies that something much deeper and closer to her heart lay beneath them. After meeting and marrying her husband in China, Emily had returned to the States with a servant, Lu Q, who stayed with her through being widowed, becoming lighthouse keeper, and until her retirement. We can't know the details of the relationship between a white woman of the time and her non-white servant, but we can only assume that after so many years together, Emily understood the tragedy of racism in a more personal way. In that context, this simple recording of a community event feels like much stronger commentary. Here's Eleanor Morris interpreting Emily's feelings. China, when I was 17, was a very busy and strange place and so many different languages and different kinds of foods and uh, different smells and different customs and traditions. And it helped me see that While we may have our special niche in the world and our inheritance from our ancestors, it's true of others as well. Lynn Gunther's research shows that the Hecox family in Santa Cruz showed no hesitation in having friendly and personal relationships with the non-white people around them. Her father was a judge. He was one of the first judges here in Santa Cruz. I think he was appointed judge basically because he was literate. He could he could read, <laughs> which made him kind of eligible for these higher positions. And um, if you read through kind of the history and um, you know who they associated with, I think they were very open to um, you know. M- and and they really did try to fit in with the people when they first moved here with the Spanish and the Native American people and uh, and 
Margaret Hecox learned Spanish right off the bat as soon as she arrived here. So I really do think that they had a great sensitivity to the people who were living here, to the people who were working here. They were very fair-minded. They were considered very fair-minded. Uh, Theo D'Estrella actually wrote a beautiful tribute to Margaret Hecox when she died. And it mentioned that sh- that they were you know, they showed hospitality and generosity to everyone. I really imagine that was the foundation of their family beliefs. They actually uh, helped promote um, bringing Black children into the schools and, and, um, and, and integrating the schools. There's a lot of evidence that they were people who were interested in justice and uh, did not discriminate. Until now, we've heard Eleanor Morris speaking as lighthouse keeper Emily Fish, as she does at a number of historical locations on the Monterey Peninsula. But I found Eleanor's personal story one that serves as a fitting end to this exploration of women's lives. These lighthouse keepers may seem separated from us in time, steeped in the sepia tones of the age, but to Eleanor, Emily Fish is much more than a costume and an accent that she puts on to entertain tourists. When my mother became very ill nearing the end of her life, um, it, as the youngest daughter, it kind of fell into my lap that I would be her caregiver. And so I was her caregiver for 15 years straight. When I came out of that time period, a lot of my friends said, let's help you re-enter the world after your 24-7, 365, 15 years, <laughs> you know, time period. And so... Right at the end of that time period, I had a had life saving surgery myself. Um, uh, my baby died. My mother died. Uh, it seemed as if the world was ending, and the doctor said, "Find something that will bring you out of the house and give you exercise and lift your spirits." And I saw an advertisement for becoming a docent at uh, Point Pinos and uh, Point Sur. Uh, lighthouses. Um, They're both administrated by the Central Coast Lighthouse Keepers Association. And I went to the training. um, And indeed, that's what that became for me was uh, meeting people, beginning to become a person again myself, um, getting the exercise and interpreting the lighthouses for other people. I've always approached it uh, that I try to uh, inhabit the person in order to interpret um, and allow people to understand the expression of the spirit of the person. Um, but I guess you could say that's role playing because I do I do take the person off eventually um, <laughs> and become myself again. I have become my mother in a way. Um, but uh, again, it was because of the community and the way that people showed me connections that uh, were positive and beneficial. And you want to turn around and and give that to your community as well. Finding out about uh, Juliet Fish Nichols was a um, one of those happy accidents. I've always liked camping out. I've always liked wild places. And I thought about what would it be like if I had to live all by myself in a place like Angel Island without talking to very many people, but having lots of books to read and having nature all around me. She apparently did have a small garden plot. I love gardening. <laughs> and I think she I, she liked to draw. I like to draw. I, I felt in some ways I was like her. Maybe I'm not quite such a loner that she might have been, but it made me think that You can kind of do anything you want if you are determined to do it and to make it a success. I think the other thing that impressed me about her is that basically she was just doing her job. And yet by doing her job, she potentially saved terrible disaster. And so it's you don't always have to do something that is um, spectacular to have an impact on the world around you that just being persistent and uh, careful and making sure that everything is the best that you can do, you can have an impact. I am glad that I, uh, that I learned about Juliet, and I'm glad that, that I then pursued 
learning more about Angel Island and um, which has many more stories besides hers. And I think it's a great story to share with children. That's really been my career is writing about uh, things that I think children will be interested in learning about and finding out about the world and perhaps in this case, vicariously living the life of another person through my book. It's been a good journey and uh, different from many of my other books, but I'm glad I did it. Laura He Cox was a very inspiring person, um, you know, just because she did really live a life that she, I believe, chose. She wanted to be highly educated. Uh, she was not comfortable in school and um, partly because she, I believe she had a handicap and she felt you know, a little bit like an outsider, but she took her education very seriously and she went far above and beyond um, really any type of expectation for a woman in that age um, to learn, become scientifically educated, but she was really interested in so many different things. Uh, she learned sign language, she learned Spanish, she learned really, um, you know, the histories of, of the different places. She, she really knew a lot about the world, even though she never did travel. So I just find that so inspiring that, you know, she really kind of created her own path. She forged her own path. Really, I think she lived her fullest life. And she was very happy as a lighthouse keeper. And I think her personality was wonderful. Um, she was a wonderful person to be a, a great, you know, lighthouse keeper. She was very diligent. Uh, she paid great attention to detail. And uh, you can really see this with her scientific research, especially in mollusks. They're the smallest animals, but they actually have a huge impact, you know, on, on, on this world and, uh, just her, her diligence and, 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 and thoroughness and going back and, and seeing these animals and developing and learning how they grew and how they reproduced and how they forged. And so really just her attention to detail and, and her dedication to science, to the lighthouse, to Santa Cruz in general, um, has been very inspirational. And I just, you know, doing the whole um, kind of study of, of, of Santa Cruz's past and, and, and the past of, of California, it's always interesting. I make my family do this exercise or also my students, we stand in a spot and I would always say, well, imagine, think of this place 200 years ago, you know, what do you think it was like, you know, how do you think it's changed, you know? And so I just really, I think it's really good to get the big picture and to, to, to really look at how quickly things have changed over the years and, and to understand where we've been, where we are right now and, and where we're going to and, um, and how we make a difference in these paths. Women should find their place and then bloom where they're planted. And the lighthouse was a place where I, I bloomed. Visit babblery.com for links and information about this podcast. The Babblery is produced with support from KSQD in Santa Cruz, California.